My name is Jerry Hawkins. I'm the executive director of Dallas Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation here with my co-partner. Hi, I'm Stephanie. Thank you guys for bearing with us through the te technical difficulties. Yeah, uh, Stephanie's our uh, communications director and I'm pleased to have uh, her with us. Uh, Stephanie will be here with you for most of the day during the session. Uh, so thank you for being here. Our uh, just really quickly, our uh, website is dallastrht.org. Um, if please feel free to share anything you learn or um, you know experienced anything here using the hashtags dallastrht uh, and the hashtag how we heal. Uh, our social media is at dallastrht. Uh, so please uh, feel free to also uh, you know reach out to us. Our social media tags are on here as well. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, before we start, we want to start with some community agreements. Um, we invite you to listen with your eyes, ears, and heart. We invite you to notice moments of discomfort and stay curious. Uh, we invite you to share in the chat uh, and share your truth without blame or judgment. Uh, we want you to be courageous and use I statements. We want you to take care of yourself, especially in uh, Zoom times. And we also want you to be open to the experience of the session and each other. Uh, thanks, Steph. Uh, Dallas TRST's mission is to create a radically inclusive city by addressing race and racism through narrative change, relationship building, and equitable policies and practices. Um, we have this vision of this Dallas where no North and South divisions uh, exist uh, in terms of race, wealth, arts, culture, health, safety, education, and opportunity. And we want our communities to actively, honestly, and openly acknowledge, repair, and heal from its past and present racial inequities. Um, thank you, Steph. And we do that through our framework. Uh, our framework starts with narrative change. Um, that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, narrative change for us happens in two ways. Um, it's the truth part of our work, and we create space for uh, narratives to, uh, you know, be shared that have not been shared in previous times. So we want to create space for um, everyone to, to share that narrative about their history and about their past. But we also want to combat um, racist narratives and discriminatory narratives and stereotypes in these areas, which include entertainment and um, journalism, news media, digital media, publishing, school curricula, uh, uh, cultural institutions and monuments and parks and many more things. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Thanks, Steph. One of the TRHT guiding principles is that there must be an accurate recounting of history, both local and national. And in order to do that, a common prerequisite to an effective and enduring effort to achieve racial equity and healing is full and accurate knowledge of the role racism has played in the evolution of communities. So Jerry and I are gonna go through what some of that language means um, for our initiative. Thank you. So we wanna start off uh, Language Matters by uh, just talking about the five ways in which we do our work um, and the, the five uh, ways in which we partner. And, and also by starting this kind of common language that we want folks to start to engage in a little bit more. We're gonna start with race. Um, race as we define it as a, as a political construction. It's really important to talk about the political construction of race. Uh, it's created by European anthropologists, scientists, and philosophers. We're gonna talk about one of those European uh, anthropologists and why this is so important uh, later. But um, um, this political construction that groups people based on shared physical and social cues into categories that have values assigned to the dominant white group. Um, one of the biggest things for TRHT is to uh, try to dismantle this hierarchy of human value. And so it's really important to us. Next one, uh, Steph. Um, it's really important to know what race is not. Race is not ethnicity. Um, it is not a shared cultural heritage of a group even though sometimes we conflate the two. Um, it is not based in science, genetics, or biology. It is not natural. Uh, it is not old. Uh, it is a new idea. When we talk about new, we're talking about the last 500, 600 years. Um, it is not set in stone. It is fluid with the exception of the top and the bottom of the hierarchy. 
and it is not nationality. It's not your belonging to a nation or a country. Um, but it is this uh, really um, insidious thing called racism, which is connected to race. Uh, race actually comes from racism, not the other way around. And this great um, equation for race is this thing starts with what we all have, which is prejudice. We all have these unfounded beliefs about people and about things, and it's irrational fear. And if you combine those things, that, that makes prejudice. But what we don't all have is institutional power, and that is the, the power to enact those unfounded beliefs and those irrational fears uh, onto other groups of people, which, which equals racism. And it includes this, compact, uh, this complex system um, that we're gonna talk about right here. Um, looking to the left first at this diagram, uh, racism has four levels. It includes number one, um, this internalized racism or this uh, internalizing of white supremacy culture, um, where we believe uh, that some people are superior and some people are inferior. Uh, and it interacts with people differently based on your racial category. Um, there's also interpersonal racism. This is the racism that we see um, every day on social media, uh, but that also uh, is not the most insidious. Um, what we're trying to combat is systemic racism. Um, and those are the, the two different uh, boxes that you see. First is the institutional racism, which happens in all of our different organizations and groupings, in churches, in uh, schools, in um, government buildings. And then that those institutions come together to create a structure. And structural racism uh, is uh, the system working as designed. Uh, a few things to know that racism is in everything and everywhere in the United States. It will not die out because of um, kids getting older or, or people in older generations dying out. Uh, reverse racism isn't real. Color blindness is a form of racism, and malice is not required for racism to occur. Thanks, Steph. Uh, racial healing. Um, it's really important, racial healing uh, to us. Um, racial healing is the process in which restores individuals to wholeness, and this is every individual. Um, all of us are being damaged by racism. It causes us to check a box, uh, a racial box that is completely made up, but it also causes us to um, throw away those cultural heritage uh, points and those uh, traditions and all of the things that come with being part of a people from somewhere else. We are all indigenous to a, a, a place, but becoming white or becoming black or becoming Asian in this country uh, requires us to leave things out. And so racial healing is a process of restoring that. Um, Thanks, uh, it, it uh, benefits all people but because regardless of our background, we're all living in and impacted by those narratives and conditions, um, whether it's how you, where you choose to live, where you choose to uh, send your kids. It is really important that uh, we know that racial healing is for everyone. Thank you, Seth. The racial equity uh, definition is really important as well. It's the process and outcome that will be achieved if one's racial identity no longer predicated in a statistical sense how one fares. Um, so we need everyone in their institutions to uh, analyze data and information about race and ethnicity. We want folks understanding disparities and learning why they exist. We need folks looking at the problems and their root causes from a structural standpoint. Remember that four levels of racism. We want to get down to the root, not the, the, the uh, existing problems that we can see, but what can't we see? And then naming race explicitly. And that's really important. We're going to talk about that in language today. Uh, next step. Um, and then racial justice, which is also part of this um, you know, language matters. It's really this proactive reinforcement of policies, practices, attitudes, and actions that produce equitable power. And so in other words, how do we um, keep what we win when we fight for something together and we win something, how do we keep it? This is racial justice and we're gonna talk about racial justice. It can be a small thing like sending a tweet or it can be a large thing like creating a policy. 
and racial justice is very, very important. Um, so let's talk about that. Let's get into some language. Um, we often hear um, a lot of uh, proxy words when it comes to uh, race. Uh, some of them are so funny they make you want to cry, and some of them are just so maddening that you want to like throw your phone once you read them. Um, so let's get into them right quick. Um, let's start with the next slide, Steph. Um, um, how many of you all have heard racially charged, or racially tinged, or racially insensitive, uh, racially motivated, racial undercurrent? What does all that even mean? What, is it, what does something mean to be racially charged, right? This is what I mean about, you know, it could be almost hilarious, but it's just, um, it makes you want to cry. Uh, it doesn't mean that someone, something is, uh, race is plugged up to the wall, right? Um, we want to get rid of all of these proxy words and these euphemisms um, and, and name something what it is. Uh, we believe in calling um, out racism and we believe in um, saying a thing uh, when it is a thing. So we want to get rid of these um, adjectives and these modifiers and really just call a thing a thing. Next slide, Steph. So Steph, you want to do this one? This is an excerpt from the Associated Press style book. Um, they've recently updated their race related coverage. And so it's explicitly stated in AP style that you are not to use euphemisms for racist or racism when the latter terms are truly applicable. For example, Mississippi has a history of racist lynchings, not a history of racially motivated lynchings. Lynchings aren't racially motivated, they're racist. So there's now um, a system in place to, to hold people accountable for the language that they use. And so here's another word that we wanna really get folks to move towards another way of being, and that's minority. Um, what does minority mean? Uh, minority as a word has been weaponized to uh, talk about people of color. Uh, when we talk about groups, um, especially racial groups, uh, we are sending signals out to the world of what they have um, when it comes to community value. Um, minority is a word that we want to move past because of this. Um, this is uh, projection of Dallas County by population. As you can see already in, in 2020, uh, Dallas County is a majority people of color county already. Uh, using minority in this sense is probably not the right word to use because it is not true, right? It is, it is a misnomer. And that word a minority has a really important definition to it, right? It's a smaller number or part, especially the number that is less than half of the whole number. And obviously that doesn't apply to Dallas County, but it doesn't apply to a large swath of the country, uh, particularly in education. Last year, there were more uh, kids in, uh, in public education that were kids of color than any other kids. So it's really important to um, start to use other words like people of color that are better descriptors of uh, what is happening in our in our country. Next slide. So here's an, another one too. Um, we hear um, the federal uh, government saying this, um, the representative of our federal government saying this a lot, um, but it's also this um, lack of capitalization of uh, this word. Um, I've heard, uh, look at my black, or the blacks are doing this, right? Um, the thing that capitalization does is really give um, what it's supposed to do, and that is making the proper noun um, really important. Uh, we are moving towards like recognizing that um, Black and, and the word indigenous, which is also in this AP guide, is a very important to capitalize because you're talking about a group of people with a culture, you're talking about a group of people with a language, and that's really important. This is just from uh, yesterday, AP changes writing style to capitalize being black. 
Uh, but I also want to note that there have been black publications that have been capitalizing black for decades, uh, such as the Essence magazine and the Chicago Defender. Um, so it's really important that we capitalize black and we don't use the plural version of that word, which is also very demeaning. Next slide, Steph. The fact that the AP, um, that AP didn't change their writing style until, um, you know, this week, this past week, shows that we have to kind of lead the narrative change and the AP style in the system will follow. We can't use that as an excuse to continue perpetuating inequitable language. And here's an example of narrative change in action. And so um, this is a tweet. Uh, I saw that Dallas ISD, um, after the AP style uh, change, was using this um, lowercase black in their communication about black students and black lives. Um, and so all I did was send a message to them uh, saying capitalize the B in black. Y'all late, right? This is, this is really happening. Um, it's really important that um, once you read that, I want you all to go to the AP um, guide and check out what they're saying. And, and it just takes an easy Google, just Google capitalize B in black and you'll, you'll read about it. Uh, but you can see the response from DISD's great point won't make that mistake again, which is funny too, because that like who was running your social media? But uh, that was really a, a really interesting point. I also want to reinforce this point from my colleague, Dr. Eve L. Ewing. Um, what she said was um, back during um, holiday season last year was um, that capitalizing black but not white isn't an issue of respect or uplift, but rather reinforces the issue that whiteness is racelessness, um, that white people are simply normal, neutral bodies and race only matters to the rest of us, which is not true. Uh, whiteness is also um, denoting race, and that is really important that we uh, you know, use the same um, capitalization for white folks and also for black people. Uh, so it's really important that we uh, you know, use that. And I, I um, really uh, implore folks to, to Google the conversations, particularly around AP, because it is the most influential style guide we have in media uh, to, to hear their uh, conversation around it. And go to the next slide. Um, and this is really important too. Um, so because a lot of people are very hesitant to talk about race, uh, they use people of color as a coverall when they're talking about a specific racial group. Um, and one of the largest um, mistakes that folks make when they're talking about uh, people of color is they really mean to talk about black folks. Um, this is something that we can do. We have to be very explicit and very specific when we're talking about a group of people. And so using people of color when we're talking about black people is not the way to do it. And we, we're seeing this a lot, particularly around uh, police violence and around racism. Uh, uh, recently, when we're talking about George Floyd, Mark Arbery and Breonna Taylor, um, is that uh, when people are talking about police violence enacted on black people, they use this coverall saying people of color uh, when there are ways and there are means in which to use that that are very um, important, but not when you're talking about a specific group. And so it's really important to think about that as well. Um, this is an, an, another one too. Um, Caucasian, um, Anglo-Saxon, when we really want to say white people, uh, because that is the racial category, particularly used on the census. And I want to uh, talk about Caucasian for a minute. Uh, because it is pseudoscience. Um, so Blumenbach, uh, who is an anthropologist and a, a scientist, created this hierarchy. Um, it was really thinking about creating these racial groups, um, which included uh, groups like mongoloids, negroids, and caucasoids. Um, in this hierarchy, he put uh, people who he called Caucasian at the top, uh, because he said they looked like the most beautiful people, right? And so he, we created these racial uh, groups based on these hierarchies and that um, kind of classification of racial groups spread 
amongst European anthropologists and scientists in the 1600s. And so uh, it is literally based on the pseudoscience, based on someone who is um, obviously a European person saying that other European people were the most beautiful people in the world, um, and not based on uh, anything other than that, right? This racial classification um, as myth. And so uh, we, we want to dismantle that. Um, and unfortunately, there are still people using Oriental um, as a descriptor for Asian Americans. Uh, we definitely don't want to use that as well, um, based on very uh, racist language as well. So we're, we're, we're definitely not using that. And I also uh, want to share this about Asian American and about terms like people of color. Um, the term Asian American is um, really important because it's based on solidarity with uh, other oppressed groups. Um, activists and academics trace the origins of that term back to 1968 in the University of California and also San Francisco State, where students uh, who were inspired by the Black Power Movement uh, founded the Asian American Political Alliance as a way to unite uh, these uh, disparate uh, Asian groups, uh, the Japanese folks, Chinese community and Filipino community together as students who were, um, you know, joining in in solidarity with the black uh, students um, to fight against oppression. So it's really important that these terms are understood. And the last thing is, um, you know, we have to be careful using um, Latino, Hispanic as a racial descriptor. Um, according to the U.S. Census, which is also a document about race, um, Latinx people can be black, Latinx people can be white, they can be native, and many other racial descriptors. Um, Mexico just started using um, Afro-Mexican as a racial descriptor in 2015, even though black people have been there since the beginning of the slave trade and before. So it's, it's really important that we um, dig into a data and, and ask some, some different types of questions about race and also explaining how race works when it comes to uh, people um, in between the margins and that binary of being white and black. And that binary is set up for a reason. So folks can make a choice of being one or the other when they're in the middle. And it's, it's a really terrible choice to make. We also have to be careful using native and indigenous as a descriptor of people who are from American Indian tribes. Um, there are over uh, 570 uh, federally regulated Indian nations in the United States and they want to either be called by their name or we have to ask them what they want to be called. Here in Dallas, um, our native or indigenous people um, explain why they use American Indian um, as a descriptor. They said that American Indian is the language that is used in the treaties that the United States has still refused not to um, honor and that they are gonna use that language until uh, this country does that. And so it's really important that we um, you know, reach out to our native indigenous and American Indian folks and ask them what they want to be called uh, and follow that as well. The process of asking people what they want to be called is self-identification. It's an important principle because it actually becomes an act of resistance to be able to claim your identity um, versus being categorized and, and labeled by the dominant power is an important part of progressive language. And to, to, to go further into that concept, um, this term identity politics is used in the media a lot to talk about, um, it's very, very um, crazy way of, of describing, um, you know, identities of people. But it wasn't really meant to do that. Um, the term identity politics was first coined by the black feminist Barbara Smith and the Kambahi River Collective in 1974. And uh, these women got together, these black feminist uh, queer women got together to talk about, um, you know, identity as a way of getting to the most pure politics um, and not politics in the electoral sense, the politics and meaning that um, what we do and what we're fighting for is, is directly out of our lives and is connected to our identity. And this quote that she said is that the most pr profound and potentially most radical politics, and we're talking about radical meaning getting to the root, 
um, comes out of our own identities. Um, so imagine thinking about American politics, which is not necessarily based on um, the identity of anyone except for who was created for it, which was in the beginning, um, white men. And so um, this identity politics uh, term was coined by them to help all of our groups get to the root of the issue. Um, and so it's really important that we uh, get to the root. Uh, we have some some questions in the chat, and I want to get to those before I, I we uh, close out. Or I close out my part. Um, the first one is um, I'm getting lost with the do or do not cap, the be in the black, and um, what I have always used, and this is from um, my professors who are uh, working in um, African and, and African American studies, is that we always capitalize the being black. Um, Black publications have done that for years. We always capitalize the being black. It is uh, representing a group of people and was representing a, a culture. And so we always capitalize the being black. And now the AP style guide, which is the most influential style guide for media has made that their style. And so they're gonna do that as well. Other magazines have started that in 2018 and 2019, other publications. But um, my recommendation is that we always capitalize black. I am um, always doing that. And that is, um, I think that AP Style Guide also is now capitalizing indigenous. I think the other question is, where is will there be a PDF of the slides sent out? Uh, I'm not sure that we will be sending out a PDF, but we will be posting the video. And uh, maybe we can talk to uh, you know, our staff about doing that. And then and the you're last more than welcome is, uh, to post screenshots or pictures of the presentation as well. That's right. Um, the other one is, can you explain why Black is more correct than African American, while Asian American is more correct than Asian? It's a great question. Uh, black is not more correct than African American. I think that those things have um, are fluid over time, which is why we have to understand how race works. Um, it is literally a political construct. It is something that we create. And so it's, it's very fluid. Uh, but I think that black as a, a coverall term um, applies to more people than just African-Americans. Um, there are African immigrants who uh, um, may not have uh, originated or not from, from you know, um, this country who also are black. There are people who are black in the diaspora. And so the, um, black covers a, a not just race, uh, but also culture. And, and I think that that's really important as we uh, talk about race and racism being a very global thing. Um, and the same for Asian American. Asian American, because it is denoting uh, nationality, um, that Asian American is just getting very specific to a group. And that um, it was created by other Asian Americans is really important. Um, that folks are identifying themselves and that self-identification is a, a, a political resistance. Um, Patricia uh, said that folks have, the uh, educators that she's worked with um, prefer not to use the word tribes, they use the word nation. And again, that is something that we ask native folks. Every uh, native nation or tribe has a different way of describing themselves. And I think it's really important that we ask them. Um, I, and there's another question about, are we gonna cap white? Yes, because I think that is really important that uh, you know, uh, people who are raised as white um, also have that same uh, culture and that same uh, way uh, describing themselves as well. So it's really important. And it's important that we do that ahead of the AP style and we don't wait for them to follow. They don't change their style book until the, the larger sort of narrative changes. And so we have to lead that and start um, making that the norm, and then they'll update it to follow. That's right. And so the last question I'm going to let Stephanie answer um, after her presentation, because I think she's going to address that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the last thing I want to address is this phrase, women of color, is also is really important to learn where the origins of these phrases come from, was developed and introduced um, for why use by a group of Black women activists at the National Women's Conference. Um, there was a group of black women who came to the conference uh, with a black women's agenda uh, after the conference created a, a minority women's agenda that didn't address the uh, intersectional needs of those black women at that conference. And so 
Uh, they, in solidarity, remember these words in terms are solidarity terms, um, got with other women of color, um, other um, groups of women who wanted to join with the Black women's agenda. And because it wasn't just Black women in the group anymore, they created this phrase, uh, women of color in 1977. So I think it's really important that um, you know, we, we get to the uh, origin and the root of some of these things. And we see that most of them are based in solidarity and that we also are really charged with, um, you know, pushing these institutions to um, be named what uh, the group wants to be named. And that's really important. Uh, so, so that's really important. Thanks, Jerry. Um, there's another you, question Stephanie. from Elaine. Um, about the capitalization, um, the difference between dad being capitalized versus um, black being capitalized. Black used as a very specific adjective to describe people, communities, et cetera, um, needs to be capitalized versus a, a noun like dad. Um, and then Sarah, I'll be covering hopefully some of the questions that you had in the next section. Um, one thing that I want to talk about now um, in regards to stereotypes and reinforcement of stereotypes is this idea of the culture of poverty. And it's a stereotype or a notion that poor and working class people are poor because of inherent qualities about them or the, their community. They don't know how to work. They don't have the motivation to work. They're dependent on public assistance. Um, the idea that poverty is intergenerational because poverty itself is um, pathological and cyclical um, and how that plays out in um, uh, racism is things like a 1965 report from Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan who um, entitled The Negro Family, The Case for National Action, where he stated that poor Blacks in the United States were caught in a tangle of pathology, the core reason for which the breakdown of the Black family, specifically the decline of the traditional male-headed household, resulted in a deviant matriar matriarchal family structure. Um, so this is kind of an example of where uh, stereotypes are, are blaming um, the people that are being stereotyped versus the systems that um, cause this. Something that I like to go to um, to acknowledge data and bring awareness to systemic racism is facts like the, um, oops, I'm sorry, I lost my, my shared window one second. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, the racial wealth gap. So right now, well, in 2016, um, the net worth of a typical white family was nearly 10 times greater than that of a black family, 171,000 versus 17,150. That stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's based on years of systemic racism, oppression, redlining, um, predatory lending, uh, still the remnants of slavery. Um, and so those are important statistics. If you want to start talking about poverty, you can't separate it from race and racism. Um, here's another look at um, when we talk about poverty, what we really mean to talk about is black people. It's also people of color, but specifically the, the biggest gap is between white families and black families. And we can't talk about poverty without talking about race. The other um, kind of misnomer is that, you know, there's also poor white families as well, and they experience uh, similar oppression and challenges. But when it comes down to it, uh, New York Times did this study, the sons of black families from the top 1% millionaires had about the same chance of being incarcerated on a given day as the sons of white families earning $36,000. So all of these systemic issues come down to one thing, and that is race over, over everything, over poverty, over socioeconomic status. Um, so then we start seeing words like this, inner city, disadvantaged, working poor, at risk, low income, less fortunate, um, underprivileged, um, underprivileged, marginalized. Um, I, I, would, I would guess that if you are from the nonprofit space or from the philanthropy world, you may have seen this even in your organization's mission statements or your, your vision and uh, grants that you've applied for. Um, these are all sort of euphemisms to talk about the populations or the communities that we're serving in our work. And I'm going to go into some of the problematic uh, issues around this. 
it's very prevalent. At the time um, in 2012, um, this woman did a study on the keywords at risk youth. Um, in a scholarly search engine, there were 6,811 articles with that phrase. Um, a Google Scholar search found um, a million three hundred eighty thousand documents. There were um, over thirteen million images with those keywords at risk youth. Um, we see it still today. This was um, back in June. There was a story that was um, circulating about one of our nonprofits in Dallas, Cafe Momentum, um, and the the language that was used in multiple um, outlets was. Uh, equipping at-risk youth, um, aiming to help you, um, employs at-risk youth, um, and helps at-risk youth. Uh, and the problem with using at-risk is that the discourse of risk ignores institutionalized structures of inequality and a systemic analysis of what places youth at risk. We are labeling the youth without talking about why there are risk factors affecting them. Um, just to kind of piggyback off of Jerry and the, the power of Twitter and narrative change, um, D Magazine had also used this language, um, plucked at risk youth plucked from the juvenile system. And I had kind of done a snarky tweet about it because I've, I've just been seeing it so much, especially um, these days when people are starting to awaken to social justice. And the tweet actually led to a very productive and inspiring conversation with the editor of D Magazine, Matt Goodman, and the writer of this article. Um, and they ended up changing the language in their introduction. And not only that, they also acknowledged that they changed it and why. And so at the very bottom of the article, they write, an earlier, earlier version of this story included the inaccurate phrase, at-risk youth plucked from the juvenile detention system, Plucked failed to acknowledge the agency of the young men and women who chose to or choose to actively participate in the program and at risk was improperly used as an adjective without specific data to support it. We apologize for the sentence. Um, it's so important that um, that they showed that their transparency and that they learned and that they grew. Reclaiming power from racist systems uh, takes a willingness to come to the conversation with curiosity and openness and a willingness to get it wrong without letting that stop us from continuing to try to understand and do better. That's from the someofus.org's uh, progressive style guide and it's very important. And it's also just very hopeful to me that change is possible. If you look at this article um, from D Magazine back in 2012 even um, about the same organization, how Cafe Momentum saves juvenile offenders um, and that kind of white saviorism and that, that narrative and how it's shifted now to giving the young people the agency. Um, a lot of times when we talk about things like this, using at risk as as an adjective in terms like marginalized, underprivileged, the question always is, what do we use instead? Um, and what I would argue is that we don't use labels at all. So people first language um, is where you just assume that everyone has sort of inherent equality. And instead of labeling people, you talk about them situationally. So you don't say, um, um, anything that focuses on the person um, or any sort of deficit-based language. Uh, more specifically, it acknowledges the inherent equal value of every individual before attaching any other descriptor. So it's very important that the person comes first and then you describe things that are temporary or that are out of their, their control and they're not inherent qualities. And um, communicating using person first language begins with empathy. Um, there's also this sort of uh, trend to, to combat deficit uh, language and labels with uh, asset-based ones and uh, things like at promise instead of at risk, at hope, um, high potential, opportunity youth. Um, and I tend to agree with Valerie Strauss, who's a reporter for Washington Post, that while well-intended, the problem with that is it could easily be seen as a condescending euphemism for the term it was meant to replace. Either way, it is, um, it's labeling people um, based on circumstances that um, are out of context. Just an example of uh, how this looks uh, in 
in practice, instead of saying disadvantaged youth, you are more specific and you're saying young people experiencing educational disadvantage if you're talking um, in, in the education field. And hopefully that kind of goes to your earlier question, Sarah. Um, resources or programs for at-risk students becomes resources to reduce risk factors for students. And, and the, risk, the riskiness is not attributed to um, the personality or the, the life of, of the student. Another important thing in language that, that can get missed is passive versus active voice. And for the writers in the room, we know we're told to use active voice anyway, just as a best practice uh, for more engaging writing. Um, but the problem is that uh, it's also used in power and racism. And so anytime that you can use the active voice to name the actors of oppression, um, whether human, institutional, or cultural, it's always a good opportunity. Um, how this plays out in the media is that it's a, it's a tool of white supremacy. It takes the, the agency and the choice out of, um, out of people that are perpetuating violence against black people, against people of color. The media uses phrases like officer involved shooting. Um, we'll switch to passive voice when a black man is shot and they'll say, and we'll say shots were fired instead of a police officer shot a black man. Um, media and headlines are so critical to the narrative. Um, on the left of this, this slide is headlines that were describing victims, um, black victims. Um, and then on the right is white suspects and the language that is used for black victims um, being more demeaning and dehumanizing than the people that are actually accused of committing crimes, um, blaming victims versus giving white people um, the ben benefit of the doubt just um, by default. We see this also in uh, this quote from T Toni Morrison, I think speaks very uh, accurately. Oppressive language does more than represent violence. It is violence. It does more than represent the limits of knowledge. It limits knowledge. Language is not this passive thing. It, it it changes how people are treated. It it changes who gets who gets killed, who gets um, seen as a victim, who gets funding, who um, who gets empathy, um, and it it changes the scope of how we see people. These are examples of um, not just the headlines, but but imagery as well um, in the media and this implicit bias and explicit bias of. Um, giving white um, perpetrators, you know, that they are featured in their senior class photos or, or their work uniforms um, versus mugshots uh, for, for black people. Um, and we see this every day. These are just a few examples. And that's the problem. Consistently defining people in denigrating terms is one way that racist narratives become institutionalized and part of the culture. We see these things and sometimes don't even think critically about them because it's so common and it's really ingrained in, in our world now. And we're still seeing it play out um, today. And um, one specific example is how we talk about looting and rioting and protesting in this, this time of um, movement and the Black Lives Matter. Um, this is from back in, um, during Hurricane Katrina, um, you see an image of a young black man and the caption says looting a grocery store. And then when it's two white people, they're finding bread and soda, they're resourceful, they're, you know, surviving. Um, and so those, those small things can make such a big difference in the larger narrative. Um, so what I believe that we need to do to help combat some of these um, looking at these stories through this white supremacist lens is that we need to tell stories from the perspective of the community being represented. It, it's, it's time to let people tell their own stories to make sure that uh, we are giving platforms. We don't give people voices, something very important. Everyone is born with a voice in their stories. No organization, no philanthropic movement gives someone their voice. Um, the problem is that voices are not given value. They're not given platforms. They're not given the amplification that they deserve. Um, and so it's time to start um, creating space for those stories to bubble up and um, take their place in the larger narrative. 
there are some risks and considerations to storytelling. Um, and this, this happens a lot in, um, nonprofit, in the nonprofit space when uh, organizations are competing for grants or for funding and trying to establish themselves as the most you know, impactful and, and serving the needs of the community. And so oftentimes they will use stories of the people that they serve um, to show the work that they do. There's risks involved in that. There's the, the, the possibility for re-traumatization. If, if you are asking someone to tell the story of one of their lowest moments and to, to show the progress that they made or the work that you had helped them do, there's implicit pressure to say the right thing um, to help your outcome. There's also a fear of reality not matching the narrative. If you're telling the story of someone um, and it's a success story, um, but then something happens and they um, end up reoffending or something like that. There's this, this fear that they've failed you in some way. Lack of control over their story. So you could, um, you could be taking the story or the testimony of, uh, of someone and then it's give your, the name is changed or details are changed or it's used for a purpose that you didn't originally intend. And then you have to consider the potential reach of digital content. This, these aren't just going in, you know, printed annual reports that only the, the rich white board members and donors see. You know, you, you share something on social media, it could go viral. A video can be seen by millions of people. And so you have to really be careful about the stories you tell and make sure that they are um, representing um, the original um, intent. When it comes to social media and digital marketing, um, imagery is also, it, it goes beyond the language that's used. It's, it's everything that we see. It's the, the post in itself and um, using images that are respectful, that don't stereotype the subject or reinforce the trauma. We don't um, share pictures of people at their lowest moments just to, just to make it seem more dramatic or um, that the people that are donating to your cause are making more of a difference. Um, considering the angle of the photograph, like being on someone's level instead of being condescending and taking the shot above them. Um, don't retain images for longer than necessary. If you're using pictures of um, a student when they're um, 13 years old and they came out of the juvenile justice system, you know, and you're still using that image of them five, six years down the road when they've started applying for jobs and now they're stigmatized with that imagery that you used um, for your benefit. And then when possible, avoid um, using stock images of people out of context or without a connection to the original message or story. Um, I, I look at things like this, um, stock photos. This was a Thanksgiving post on an organization's page. Um, it, it, to me, it's just almost lazy storytelling. It doesn't serve a purpose um, and it's not representative of, of the actual work being done in the community. It's not necessary. Um, and stock photos just look very generic in general. The other issue on the flip side, there are amazing sites like unsplash.com where you can get um, sort of non-stock looking photos. Um, like this one, for example, um, the student spotlight, Mitchell's story, um, a recent high school graduate, Mitchell had hoped to be preparing for college. There's one problem though, the, the young man in that picture is not Mitchell. Um, and I know this because I worked at an organization that you, that, that um, Christian, the, the young man in the story, uh, did a video and the videographer that we hired took a still image of him without our knowledge uploaded it to unsplash.com where it has had over 8 million views has been downloaded 48,000 times and now it's being used for other organizations like the one in the previous slide with a different name and 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 I understand that his face isn't seen and he's not identifiable, but everyone that worked with him on that shoot that day on that video where we were trying to protect his story and his identity, he would know that that is him and that and that's a problem to me. Um, when it comes to storytelling, um, photography, videography, I go back to something that I heard Brian Stevenson, um, the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, um, 
said in a, in a speech at the Momentous Institute's conference, and that's to be proximate, to get proximate, to get close, to be in community with the people whose stories you are telling and the work that you're doing. Um, it's not enough to go in one day to drop in and take pictures and, and think that you've covered the story and you know what's happening. Um, you have to spend time, get to know the people you're documenting, explain your role, who you are, what the purpose of the story is, who's going to see it. Um, when you go in and you talk to parents, let them know this is going to be on our Facebook channel. We have you know, more than 5,000 followers. Uh, we're gonna use this story for our annual report and for a fundraiser. Um, make sure they know the scope of what their, their story is um, gonna be used for. Respect boundaries, privacy, dignity. You can tell pretty clearly when people are not comfortable in front of the camera, when they're feeling uneasy, when there's um, privacy issues, uh, especially with young people, the school may have gotten kind of a umbrella media release for all of the students, but there's students that are in the foster care system that can't be photographed with other considerations. And always make sure they're happy with the representation. And, and I, I learned this kind of in, the, in my previous career, which was in fashion blogging. And I would take 500 photos of, of bloggers only to realize that they didn't, I took the wrong side. It wasn't their flattering side. And um, so I just got very used to asking, showing people the pictures beforehand and making sure, and deleting pictures right off the bat. Um, if, if they weren't happy with them, because there's always a chance, like you know you're not supposed to use that photo, but then you leave an organization and it gets passed on or it, you never know who, who it ends up in the hands of. Creating a safe space for storytelling is so important. Um, that idea that I talked about before, deep consent. You're not just telling them, you know, you're giving us the rights to this photo. You're give, we are going to retain the rights to this photo for this many years. It, 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 it has the potential to go to this, this many places. We might send it to a newspaper and to be featured in a story. Um, and speaking of stories, look beyond the obvious story. It's so easy to, to fall into these tropes, especially in the nonprofit sector of um, the white savior organization um, swooping in and helping these people from communities in need. Um, and it takes away from the capacity for um, assets within that community, the joy. Um, people paint poverty um, in a very dramatic and negative um, light without looking at um, the resilience of the communities um, in those areas and, and the things that they bring uh, for their kids, for their neighbors, um, emphasize growth over hardship. And that's kind of that same line, um, find ways to show resilience and joy um, rather than tragedy and um, oppression, asset versus deficit. Um, when in doubt, um, it's the community first, donor second. If, if there's ever a, a question in your mind, um, should I do this? Think about how would you feel if you were the person in the story? Is this a story or a social media post that if it was written about you, you would wanna share with your friends and family and, and share with the world or would you be ashamed of it? If you were a parent reading about your child and um, seeing that they're considered at risk or marginalized or underprivileged, what would that make you feel like as a parent um, to see that and to see that published in a newspaper article? Um, always, always, always put the community first. Um, the reason I'm so passionate about this, even though sometimes it seems like something as simple as a tweet or a Facebook post, storytelling is the most powerful way to put ideas into the world. Um, and it has so much potential to harm, but also to help people. And it's, it's one of the I mean, if go back to Spider-Man, you know, with great uh, power comes great responsibility. We have um, anyone who has the capacity for storytelling, a platform, followers, influence, the stories we tell um, can shape people's lives. And that is something that we can't take lightly. Um, and this is not going to be changed overnight. This is work that is still being done and still changing as we speak. Um, AP style guide, style books and style guides, um, media outlets are changing every day based on the things that we start saying and putting out into the world. Um, so what I would 
urge you to do after this as sort of your homework and your next steps, look at your organization or your company's website, look at the mission statement, look, do an audit of your social media posts, especially look at those campaigns for North Texas Giving Day or Giving Tuesday and the calls to action and what did you say about the people that you served, what language did you use and start workshopping it. Um, change that deficit based, you know, language to something people first and um, reach out to us if you need help kind of going through that process, because that's something that we really, it's part of our mission to do to uh, really spark narrative change. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Dallas TRT or supporting us, go to our website, dallastrht.org and start following us on social if you're not. Um, we're gonna continue having some of these conversations even this week. Uh, Jerry, our executive director who you heard from earlier, will be moderating a panel um, in uh, partnership with the city of Dallas. And um, some of our community partners are gonna be on the panel um, as well. So we hope you will join us for that. We are going to be uploading a video recording of this and are happy to continue answering more questions. Um, but thank you so much for joining us and everything, your willingness to learn, to do better, to make mistakes. We are really in this together. And this has been the most hopeful I've felt in a long time starting to see um, this change happen on social media, in the media, in the conversations we're having with each other and with our families and friends. So thank you for joining us.